Uh, welcome to this session on academic findings and rhetoric. Uh, I'm Josh Rao, uh, chairing the session. Very pleased to have uh, Roger Fielke here and uh, Nick Parker, whom you've heard from earlier today, one of the co-organizers of the conference, uh, to discuss this topic. So Jacob Viner is famous for having said, economics is what economists do. And uh, economists are doing a lot more on climate these days. I did a word count analysis of the American Economic Association program for its annual conference. This is the leading US Association of Economics Researchers, and this conference is their leading conference. Its attendance has fluctuated a bit uh, in, uh, over, over the decades. Uh, I used to be have, I used to have around 12,000 uh, uh, kind of PhD economists participating there. It was been down to about six or seven thousand in recent years. But I looked at the programs between 2011 and 2024 and just did a word count analysis. And uh, well, I don't want to I don't want to bury the, the the lead and jump straight to talking about climate. I have to tell you just what the overall results were. Uh, if you just rank the words that are listed um, and the, <laughs> the, the top 25 words that were in the American Economic Association program in 2024, focusing on paper titles and session titles. About half the words that were in the top 25 in 2024 were not in the top 2025 in 2011, <coughs> say. And the top ranked words that made the top 25 list in 2024 but were not on the list in 2011 include uh, gender and gendered, which is the number seven most popular topic to appear on the American Economic Association uh, program paper titles. It's, it's kind of behind things like uh, economics, and economics does appear to be the number one word, uh, uh, policy, there are a couple other words that, that just occur a lot. Uh, number eight, tied for number eight, was uh, race or racial, not in the list in 2011, not in the top 25, uh, and not even the top 50, but uh, number eight in 2024. Uh, data has become more important in our profession. Data comes out at number 10. Child and uh, inequality are two other words that are in the top 25 in the 2024 program meeting, but were not on the list in, uh, in 2011. Uh, some of the words in the top 25 of 2024 uh, that were not in the top 25 of 2011 also include uh, education, woman, dynamic, disparity. So these are, these are some of the, the trends of our profession. Now, what about climate? Okay, well, climate cracked the top 50 in 2023, and in 2024, actually topped the mentions of a field that I work on quite a bit, which is tax and taxation. So um, if economics is what economists do, and economists are uh, doing a lot more on climate, then uh, this is clearly something that uh, is beginning to redefine the field of, of economics. And it's interesting as you look at me, of course, um, I was going back and looking at, at Bill Nordhaus's 1977 uh, AEA paper, which actually was a paper that was presented at the, uh, at the AEA meetings in 1977. That paper is in the papers and proceedings. And so in a sense, maybe it uh, uh, put this topic on the map. But if you look at the AEA meetings this year, it really does include many, many papers on the topic of climate, including a pretty wide range of, 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 of general approaches. Uh, there is a paper that quantifies the impact of climate change on firm productivity. There is a paper that considers how government intervention might create moral hazards. So, for example, if you build a seawall, that might create the uh, moral hazard of locating people building property closer to the sea. There is a paper on the effects of mandatory climate risk disclosure by insurers on corporate bond investor climate friendliness. Many papers on macroeconomic models of climate change, including dynamic spatial modeling, uh, models of spatial organization of firms, generally assuming that uh, assuming things that are taken often as given that climate change will increase the frequency of natural disasters. For example, I mean that's that's something that's taken as a given in many of these papers um, based on uh, work by Bjorn Lomborg and others. I don't know whether that's uh, whether that's something to be taken as a given. Um, and, uh, and, and other uh, research looks at, at financial issues like the effects of credit constraints as barriers to green innovation. I think economists have always had a bit of a technocratic bent, so uh, economists like this topic. In fact, there was actually an American Economic Association session in 2024 called Climate Control. 
Okay, you know, we've been controlling the economy with fiscal and monetary policy. Now we're thinking, how can we control uh, the climate? There's clearly evidence of what I would call issue chasing in uh, in economics, and I think uh, it is uh, it goes kind of both both ways with the popular discourse. I think uh, economists can claim that they are just acting uh, as purely scientific agents, but uh, economists do respond to what's going on in the sphere of public discourse. Um, economists do, uh, many of them fancy themselves wanting to be influencers in some way, something that I've uh, written, about in, written about in the past. And as a result, I think that um, that is, uh, has, been, has been leading uh, economists more down the road of working on climate. This is, of course, an issue that we hear about a lot in the press. The purpose of this session is uh, to think about whether scientists, including social scientists, are using objective language to describe the environment and environmental policy, environmental issues, or whether advocacy is leaking into scientific discourse. Um, I'll give a couple examples from some other areas that, uh, that, that I've looked into and studied quite a bit. I think in the area of inequality, the economists who have written about and documented large increases in inequality in income have uh, been basically uh, feted with garlands by the popular press. Whether that uh, has actually influenced the work that they do, that's not observable, I don't know. But what is true is that other economists, including economists from the US government, uh, from the US Treasury, from the Joint Committee on Taxation, uh, have written a lot uh, in criticism of the work that has come out of universities on income inequality. The work that's come out of universities on income inequality has said that income inequality is growing, exploding, but when the government economists talk about it, they actually have a lot to highlight about what the university economists are not doing correctly. And one worries, uh, and I think hopefully this session will get at this, whether uh, the work on the environment uh, and on climate coming out of economics is going down, going down the same path. Uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to our first speaker, uh, Roger, who will um, uh, present on some of his experiences uh, in academia uh, dealing with this issue. So, thanks. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for coming back from the coffee break. Uh, thanks to the organizers. It's great to be here. I'm meeting a lot of new people. I'm not an economist. Um, all right, so I'm going to tell some stories here. Um, it was more than 30 years ago. Uh, through a series of very fortunate events, I found myself working uh, as a staffer at the House Science Committee uh, for the House of Representatives. Um, and this was when I was in grad school. And while I was there, I, I thought, you know, I'm going to ask around and see if there's a good topic. Uh, I'm a policy person, and I want to do research that's relevant. So I asked the staff director of the Space Subcommittee, um, what, what could I do a master's thesis on that would be useful to you guys? And he said to me, he said, why don't you find out how much the space shuttle cost. And you know, I sat there for a second. I said, well, I'm just a little grad student, and you're the staff director of the space subcommittee of the House of Representatives. Don't you already know that? And if you don't, can't you find that out? And what he told me really kind of shaped the rest of my career. He said, well, we can't get that answer. Um, NASA doesn't want it out. Um, NASA has money in 425 congressional districts. The members don't want that information out. So we need somebody outside to do that. So, so I did. I added up the cost of the space shuttle program. At the time, NASA said the official cost was how much it was to put hydrogen in the tank, something like $88 million. Um, I added up the cost with development cost, um, post-development cost. You had to go through all sorts of federal budgets and, and, and so on. And I came up with uh, about $1.1 billion per flight. Um, that got written up in the New York Times through another series of fortunate events. I got a call from Johnson Space Flight Center um, while I was sitting in the grad student bullpen. For a brief minute, I said, oh, they're calling to congratulate me on my excellent research. Um, they, ca they called me up and said, you need to retract that. That's going to cause us all sorts of political problems. I said, well, I can't really retract it. It's my master's thesis. Um, and I realized then that, that one of the functions that, that we have as experts in academia is to traffic in, in what one of my late colleagues, Steve Rayner, called uncomfortable knowledge. That's knowledge that challenges institutions. Um, I'm leaving academia. I'm affiliated with AEI, American Enterprise Institute, um, and my salary is going to be paid by my substack. Um, I can't do uncomfortable knowledge anymore in academia. 
And I want to talk a little bit about that in, in my experiences. Um, I'm very much of the view that both science and democracy, um, not only are they self-correcting, but they must be self-correcting. And so uncomfortable knowledge is something that's really important for sustaining both our ability to do science and to practice democracy. Um, I haven't talked about this stuff in public, so this is the first time, so apologies if it's incoherent. Um, <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, but I've come to realize that like, my personal journey and my story is part of this bigger trend that I, I see among colleagues in academia who do work on policy issues that are pol politically contentious. Um, I am the answer to a trivia question. The trivia question is, who is the only person who appeared in the Climate Gate emails and the Hillary Clinton WikiLeaks email release? Um, in both cases, uh, it was revealed that people and institutions were working pretty hard to try to suppress dissemination of my, my research. Um, the WikiLeaks emails in particular revealed that the Center for American Progress, a pro progressive group in Washington, um, had spent the better part of a decade actually focused on me. Um, they, they wrote as many articles about me as they did about George W. Bush. Um, I'm lucky that I can tell you the, the exact date that my conventional academic career reached its zenith. It was 2006. Um, I won the, the Roger Rovell Award from the, the National Academy of Sciences. I got to lecture at the Smithsonian Natural History Museum. I had an audience, I don't know if it was full, but it was like a thousand people. Um, I had dinner with the dinosaurs. Somebody once asked me, is that the members of the Academy knows? The real dinosaurs in the, in the National Academy. Um, it was fantastic, March 2006. Um, Roger Rovell, of course, was the Harvard professor who got Al Gore interested in climate change. Um, two months later, Al Gore's movie came out, An Inconvenient Truth. Um, I had won that award for my research focused on natural disasters and extreme weather events. Um, I had shown, and with colleagues, of course, that, that the overwhelming, most important factor driving the costs of disasters, both human costs and dollar costs, is where we build, what we build, how many people are there when we build, um, stuff that Matt Kahn has, has written about eloquently and spoken about today. Um, Al Gore had a hurricane coming out of a smokestack. Um, it's spinning the wrong way, FYI. Um, but at that moment, everything changed. Extreme events were associated with climate change. That was the way that philanthropists and advocates were going to bring home the issue. Three degrees in 100 years, you know, call me up in 95 years. Oh, but the disaster that just happened in my backyard is climate change. The, the whole rhetoric changed. And it turns out, with, uh, after many years with hindsight, my research became not just exciting and fun, it became inconvenient and needed to be pushed out of the way. In 2009, remember, there was this campaign against, I wasn't really aware of it at the time, um, an administrator at my university contacted me. She asked me to lunch. Um, she was a climate scientist. And um, she said, hey, you know, I want to tell you that if you keep doing the research that you're doing, um, you're going to have trouble in your career going forward. And you know, being a young, hothead researcher, I fired off a letter to the Chancellor, you're like, how can you tell me what research to do with academic freedom and all that? Um, she pr proved to be pretty prophetic. Um, so in 2013, I was invited to give testimony before the Senate um, on my research. But also at that time, the IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just released its special report on extreme events. Um, and I summarized what the IPCC said. They cited a lot of my research. Um, all the stuff I've done is very mainstream consensus science. Um, for whatever reason, my, my testimony went viral. And by viral, I mean on YouTube, it got 400,000 views in about a week. Um, that brought a lot of attention to me. Um, a few months later, President Obama's science advisor, John Holdren, testified before the same committee. And in Colorado, we say people get a little forward on their skis. Uh, he got a little forward on his skis making claims about extreme events that were um, arguably wrong, but certainly contrary to the IPCC. Um, Senator Jeff Sessions uh, embarrassed Holdren. And unfortunately for me, uh, I won't try an Alabama draw, but he said, you know, we had this professor from Colorado here a few months ago, and he cited the IPCC and said something very different from you. And Holdren, you know, mumbled, well, he's not a mainstream scientist, and you can't believe him. Holdren went back to the White House 
and wrote a six-page screed about me. It was like something your craziest uncle would put on Facebook. Um, and he posted it to the White House website. And that's when I realized the White House really is a bully pulpit. Um, I think I'm the only academic or scientist um, in the era of the internet that has been singled out by the White House for such an attack. All right, 2015, the next year, I get a letter from uh, a representative from Arizona, Raul Grijalva, uh, and it went to my university. He said, we have reason to believe, because John Holdren complained about this professor, that Professor Roger Pelkey may be taking money under the table from Exxon. Now, just as an aside, my license plate on my Ferrari does say XXON. It's, it's just a, a coincidence. That, that was uh, an incredible moment professionally for me. Um, not only was I the subject of a headline in the New York Times, um, the local Boulder paper, Roger Pelkey investigated for financial irregularities. My wife heard about it at work. My kids heard about it at school. Um, in the weeks that followed, I give a lot of talks. Um, I got disinvited to every single talk that I'd had on my calendar, maybe a dozen, two dozen, uh, except one. I was the George Mitchell lecturer at the University of Maine, and they didn't cancel, so I, you know, I called them up, said, I want you to know, you know, everybody else is canceling, you guys might want to cancel. Um, and I got a nice message back from Senator Mitchell. He said, I'm fully aware of who you are and your work, uh, and I also know how Congress works, and we look forward to seeing you in October. Um, and so that was great. Soon after, um, let me just say, my university, no one at my university at any moment in time ever spoke to me about these events. Not a word. I heard from university lawyers, they investigated me. Um, unfortunately, there's not, <laughs> there's not a, a kitty of money I'm hiding anywhere. Um, didn't find anything. Um, but I was quickly told in the months that followed, um, you know, your center that you've directed and that's brought in millions of dollars of funding and is internationally known, we can't really guarantee that it's gonna be funded anymore. So I did what uh, I thought was best. I said, all right, well, I'm leaving that center. Uh, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna drop out of the climate debate. I'm gonna go to the athletic department and study sports governance, um, which was great and fun. Um, then, uh, and I would, have been ha I would have been happy to stay there forever. Um, in 2019, I heard from the university we're gonna stop this sports governance center. Why? Well, we were having sessions on compensation of college athletes, and that was controversial. Today, we weren't wrong, we were just early. Um, but the university got very cold feet about that. Um, there's, there's much more to, to say. I was put under investigation by my department chair. My little office that they gave me was filled with boxes and empty file cabinets, making it unusable for three years. Um, all the programs that I started, including a uh, certificate in science technology policy, were terminated. And as of last fall, I had no department, no office, no service. Um, and I thought, you know, it's like George Costanza showing up at the Yankees uh, with no job. I, I, you know, part of me was like, well, how long can I just collect a paycheck and, and, and not do anything at my university? Um, I basically said, I'm going to leave. Um, I became eligible to retire last November on my birthday. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm a year younger than Steve Levitt, who's leaving the University of Chicago, so I think I'll be the youngest emeritus professor in the country. Um, so some general lessons that I, I've taken from this, and just in talking with other people and their situations. Um, universities are funny places these days. Um, administrators, um, including chairs of departments, they want to be players. They want to put out statements on this or that issue. Um, in, in programs that are relevant to policy but aren't in policy schools, like the one I was affiliated with, um, they want to think that they're actors in the political process. Um, there's a, a lot of factors, I think, that go into this. One is that our policy debates involve much more technical and expert knowledge than they used to. COVID's a great example. Um, but at the same time, and kind of paradoxically, universities are very conservative, small c places. They, want, they don't want controversy. They need funders. They need students to want to go there. So they want to be players, but they don't want to, they want, they want to swim without getting wet, I guess is how I would put it. Um, this makes it difficult if, if our job is to provide uncomfortable knowledge, at least in some settings. 
You need intellectual diversity. You need viewpoints from across the political spectrum. Um, contestation is healthy in science and democracy. Um, politicians uh, on the right and the left um, think that they can push universities to um, do this or that, uh, you know, a, a lot of issues. So it's really hard, I think, to do policy work in universities these days. Um, I'll just give some examples from my university. Um, more than a decade ago, they started a new energy institute. Um, I thought that would be a great place for me to work since I do energy policy. Um, it was titled the Renewable and Sustainable Energy Institute. They focused on everything except fossil fuels and nuclear. Well, that's, you know, that's a, a nice 7% of the global energy budget, but um, it's not going to be particularly relevant. Um, my courses on policy were not acceptable, but climate change and dance was okay. So was climate change and comedy. Um, so, you know, where I land on all this is that, that you know, this conference is titled Markets and Mandates, and, you know, I think what I would add to the discussion is norms. Um, that it's, it's, it's beyond markets or mandates when it comes to academia. We've lost our way to some degree, um, and the norm that, that, and I don't think it was, you know, there was a, a, an era where things were better. I think that the, the context within which we do politics and we do science these days has changed, and our norms have not evolved in, in parallel to that. Um, I'll end it there, and I look forward to a chance to discuss with you now and at the cocktail hour later. Thank you. So uh, th thank you. I'm happy to have this forum to discuss a working paper on science and subjectivity in academic research on the environment. It's co-authored with a PhD student, Ha Du, who is quickly gaining expertise in language modeling and text analysis. And I'll also say, Roger, that uh, this is the first time I've taken this public, but it's uh, less explosive than what you just took public. So broadly speaking, for me at least, the, the project uh, is related to my much more ambitious interest, which is to try to understand how beliefs about the environment are formed. Um, I'm interested in this question as a parent. Why do my kids, they're teenagers, why do they believe what they believe about the environment? I'm interested as a professor who teaches environmental economics, so why do undergrads and graduate students believe what they believe about the environment. I suppose if I was more introspective, I would uh, ask myself why I believe what I believe as well. Um, but the, the, the much more um, tractable questions and the narrower questions in this paper are about how often are environmental conditions objectively portrayed. So you can think about evaluating this in the context of children's books, media, political speeches. We do it here in the context of academic science articles. And we ask, is the frequency of objective portrayal, is that changing over time? Is subjective portrayal more influential? And what, what might reward or penalize subjectivity? So those, those are the questions we try to get at in this paper. And the way we do it here is we're evaluating causes and effects. And so effects is citations of academic articles. Um, based on the language in research articles. So, so far, we have a growing data set, but we have about 47,000 peer-reviewed papers from 24 journals. So these are in major science journals like Nature, PNAS. Um, they're in major economics journals, so top five journals, but also um, disciplinary journals, uh, some of them in environmental economics. So the cut that I'll present here just evaluates the text and abstracts. We're equipped to do it for the introduction for the whole paper, um, and we have some measure of subjectivity in these abstracts. Um, I will say that this presentation is more wordy than the slides I usually like to present, but I argue it's appropriate because the paper itself is about words, so I present it with a lot of words. Um, so our conception of subjectivity, I think, is summarized best um, with this point. So, you could, you could say three things about temperature rises. So A says the mean temperature is rising at an alarming rate. You could say it's rising at an increasing rate. You could say it's rising at a tolerable rate. And, and only of these, of these three statements, only B is objective. B is falsifiable. I mean, you could subject it to empirical tests. 
You could disprove it, which is the core of science, is the ability to falsify, to disprove. A and C are not. They express personal feelings, they provide unclear metrics, and they advance normative views, and that's how we define subjectivity. So before proceeding, I'm going to tell you why we think that this is important to study. We think the advancement of science, I'd say natural or so social science, the, the advancement of either type, requires the evaluation of objective, objective claims, the incentives to provide them and the incentives to evaluate them. That's how we learn. Um, and we agree with George Orwell, who famously wrote, if thought corrupts language, then language can also corrupt thought. That's why we're evaluating language. So one could imagine a, a theory um, about why writers and editors, referees, are permissive or incentivized to use subjective language. You could imagine thinking about the benefits and the costs. Um, at least some of the benefits uh, we think are, well, one, you avoid being objectively wrong. That could be a benefit, especially if you're risk averse, young researcher perhaps. Um, you could more prominently seek to advance a cause by using uh, language that expresses your personal opinions. Um, it could be a way to communicate importance. You know, this is, this is a breakthrough study. This is um, an alarming issue. And so you can signal importance, maybe even inflate importance that way. You could signal membership in a club. It could be concerned. I'm part of the club that's concerned, very concerned about climate or other issues. Or you could signal ideological affiliation. So there's potential costs as well. Um, certainly as a young researcher, if you overtly use subjectivity, it might be difficult for you to climb at least initially. We find some evidence of that. More experienced authors are more subjective than, than younger authors. Um, but the, the rewards might be personal. You might just be following a norm. You might be afraid to deviate from the norm. Um, but some of the rewards could be higher probability of getting published, uh, getting cited, which is what we measure, just getting noticed generally. So you are probably wondering how we measure subjectivity. And I, I won't get into all of the details. I mean, we use language modeling. We have a subjectivity rubric. Um, we pull random sentences from abstracts. And we pay graduate students to label them as subjective or objective based on a rubric that we provided. We've tried other things. And so in the paper, we will um, use a bunch of different measures of subjectivity for robustness. Um, we use existing language models. There's some out there. Um, but but the, the short of it is the annotators train a model, or they 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 uh, label sentences as, as objective or subjective. We put them in a language model. It's trained. Then we apply it to all the other abstracts that we didn't review. Um, and then it evaluates subjectivity. And ultimately, we're measuring uh, the probability that a sentence would be considered subjective by an annotator if a human looked at it. And that's done for each sentence. And then each abstract has a score, which is the average probability that each sentence would be considered subjective. So that, that's what we're doing. Um, just in terms of what, what the machine, le a language mo a machine learning model spits out, I mean, so we, if, we, if we rank abstracts that rank very high in subjectivity, um, these are the kinds of phrases that they use, which makes me um, feel comfortable that our, that our rubric is, is picking out uh, statements that I'd like it to pick out. So here's some environmental crisis, massive degradation, catastrophically short time, time frames, I think is the full sentence, radical transitions, urgency is obviously warranted. These are, these are statements in peer-reviewed journal articles that our model picks out as subjective. And as a point of con, uh, contrast, so what, what's deemed objective by the model 
Here's a paper that was published in 2011 in the American Economic Review. It's on Superfund cleanups and infant health, uh, a topic you could easily imagine subjective language being used to describe it. This ranks very low, really low probability, almost zero of it being highlighted as uh, subjective. And you can see the language. I mean, the language um, is precise. Uh, the language is, um, uh, you know, verifiable. You could, you know, you could, col you could collect the, the data and try to evaluate if these statements are true or not upon rep replication. Um, so it can be falsified. So in terms of, you know, what we've found so far, we're just plotting the average subjectivity score. And I'm showing you two divisions here. One is papers in economics journals that are about an environmental topic. Okay, that's the blue line. The other is papers in science journals, in Nature, uh, PNAS, that are about an environmental topic. And you know, we, we evaluate other papers that aren't about environmental topics, but that's, that's those. I'll point out two things. One, the subjectivity score is scaled from zero to 100, so 100 would be the max. These are just simple averages. Uh, you can see two things. Science articles are more subjective, uh, but both are trending up, especially articles about in the environment in economics journals. Okay, so let me explain our findings. So we have done some pretty simple regression analysis and there's other variables that are included in this analysis that I'm, I'm not showing you here. Um, but I, what I want to do is I want to just highlight, highlight two, two findings here. So the dependent variable, the variable that we are trying to explain with the data are citations. So journal articles, the citations are tracked. This is an important metric for academics. In general, you're rewarded more when your papers are cited more. Um, and so it's the, it's the aggregate number of citations since a paper was published. We published in different times from 1990 to 2022. So obviously we're accounting for how old the paper is. But after accounting for that, the um, result at the top shows that papers that are more subjective, that have a higher subjectivity score, are cited more. And that's robust to a few different ways we could run the model. In terms of magnitude, it's about a, a doubling of the subjectivity score is associated with about an 8% increase in citations. Uh, and that magnitude is really similar to if you double the author's experience, so somebody who's been around longer gets cited more, that's clear. Um, if you double the author's experience, they get cited about 8% more as well. So that, that gives you context of how important the relationship might be. So this is consistent with subjectivity being rewarded with more citations. This is true in both science articles and economics articles. So the bottom result that's highlighted just says that this is more so true if the paper is about the environment. So the one interpretation is this is a reward for being subjective. And that reward is stronger if the paper's about the environment than if it's about a different topic. So now we're just flipping the analysis and we're asking, okay, what, what are the predictors of subjectivity? I just showed you how subjectivity correlates with citations. So what kinds of papers are more subjective? And you know, I think there's interesting findings that if I had more time, I'd talk about like the number of authors and the, the paper empirical or not, the experience of the authors. But I, but I want to highlight the bottom one. And that's all that's showing is there's a positive trend in the use of subjective language in papers that are about the environment. This is true for science journals. It's true for economics journals. Uh, and so, you know, I. I alluded to this when I showed the graph that looks like there's a little trend upwards. This is a more sophisticated way to, ana to analyze this, and it says that that trend is, you know, is, is robust, that papers are becoming more subjective over time, 
if they're about the environment. Um, I don't know if that would be true if they're about inequality, Josh, or other topics. But So I'm, I'm close to wrapping up. I uh, just want to point out there's some topics that are particularly described with subjective language, whether it's articles in science journals or economics journals. So these are the big three. If if pollution is in the title, if climate is in the title, or health is in the title, the language tends to be quite, quite a bit more subjective than the other topics. So the other topics are things like electricity. Actually, in science journals where electricity is featured in the title, they're actually less subjective. Um, you know, maybe surprisingly, papers that, are, that use the word renewable in economics articles are less subjective than papers that don't. But in general, like these patterns bounce around. So if it's water, habitat, land, species, ecosystem, uh, we, don't, we don't detect as clear patterns as we do with pollution, climate, and um, what was the other one? Pollution and climate and health. OK, yeah, so let me wrap up. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll read these conclusions because um, I just want to uh, make the takeaways as clear as I can. So what have we found so far um, in this paper? Well, subjectivity is correlated with citations, especially so if the paper's about an environmental topic. That's consistent with it being rewarded in the academy. Um, science articles about the environment are more subjective than economics articles, but economics articles that are about the environment are converging closer to what science articles are in that metric. And one thing I'll point out is this isn't just because there's a compositional change. So there are more papers now about climate. There's more papers um, connecting environment to health. Uh, but if you control for the composition, if you account for that statistically, there's still growth in subjectivity Subjective abstracts of papers are cited more. So that, I mean, that's a way of saying, like, within articles that are about climate, the language is becoming more subjective. And if it's more subjective, climate papers are cited more. Um, so, of course, there's a bunch of big, broad questions uh, that one could follow up with, some more difficult to evaluate empirically than others. But, you know, important ones in my mind are you know, is subjective language a signal of subjective science? I don't know the answer to that, but it seems likely it may be. Um, does subjective language change beliefs? Is it potent? And who has incentives to enforce objective language? Who, who's out there to police this? I mean, I'm an editor of journals. Uh, I, I, um, I, my, my colleague Dan is an editor. We give graduate students feedback. Uh, as advisors, we referee papers. Uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty costly thing to do, um, and it signals something about yourself as well, uh, about you know, if you're policing language and you're, you're asking people to change how they write and how they speak. So who does have incentives to enforce objectivity and what's lost if we don't? So that, those are questions I want to raise, and I'll end it there. Thanks. Well, let's open the floor for some questions. OK, over here, first hand I saw. Yeah, thanks. Really interesting talks, both of you. Uh, this seems like a classic externality problem, right? So the decline of objectivity and the inability to air uncomfortable truths are undoubtedly contributing to the collapse in trust in academia, which probably poses an existential threat for some universities and disciplines, you know, sooner than we think. And yet the, the local incentives to be the person who's, you know, policing language in a journal or stating uncomfortable truths that, uh, you know, the athletics department has a material interest in you not stating, for example, are, you know, the cost of, the cost of doing that are high. So, so is there is there an economic solution, maybe, maybe to, to the two economists in the panel? You know, is there a Pigouvian subsidy that we could 
uh, come up with that, that might help solve this problem? I mean, well, I, 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 will, I will comment on it in the context of, um, you know, uh, the incentives of, of, the, of the agency. I, I think there is, to some, in some ways, a distinction between public universities and private universities. Uh, you know, public universities, as uh, we've discovered through the actions of state legislatures around the U.S., are in some ways, uh, to some extent, beholden to those uh, state legislatures. So, you know, if Ron DeSantis does not want critical race theory being taught in universities and believes that that is not consistent with what the people of Florida want and the legislat legislators agree, then they may craft legislation that would, uh, uh, that would, that would affect what, what can be done at universities. Um, so, you know, it, th that is a much more blunt instrument than a, you know, a sort of Peguvian, you know, Pigu a Peguvian um, uh, kind of, you know, extern you know externality uh, tax or, 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 or subsidy. But um, I, I think that for, for public universities, that's, that's probably, now, you know, you, you have experience at the public university where you were on the wrong end of that. Private universities are just completely sheltered from all market discipline. You know, it, it seems, especially top tier ones, um, it seems like uh, no matter how, uh, uh, how firm the university is in its political convictions that uh, customers, you know, parents still want to uh, send their kids to, to elite universities. And, uh, you know, professors, uh, people still want to still want to work there. So uh, I think private universities are, are by and large, uh, very sheltered from, uh, from any kind of discipline. Uh, I think with public universities, you, you, you see uh, this can work uh, in, in, in favor or against uh, a, a kind of more academic freedom. But, but currently, I think that's very, it's a very blunt instrument compared to what you might design. I, my reaction to this was, wow, I'm such a minor little problem here. Because the problem I have to deal with, and you go to, go to my blog, show me the math, uh, the fact is that journal editors don't care if the as mathematical assertions in their papers, in the papers they publish, are correct. Uh, one time I pointed out to Whitney Newey that there was a, a paper he published that was made false mathematical assertions, and his response was, well, that's what the authors knew. Of course, I don't, having studied logic, I don't know how you can know false statements. Um, and then uh, others, I tell authors before they publish their papers about the errors, and uh, nothing changes. And I bug them, and they say, well, I just didn't want to change it. It would have hold, held up a uh, publication. So the problem here, the subjective or objective language business is a minor thing. The editors, as I document, the editors and authors in journals don't even care if the math is correct. And this is econometrica we're talking about. We're not talking about whether or not the math is correct in QJE. OK, but this is a journal that's supposedly uh, the top premier mathematical economics journal. And they don't care about the accuracy of the math. And I don't want to go into details, you know, but uh, it's not irrelevant. They're not tangential to the, to the paper. So, um, no, th this, this may be a thing, but the key thing is editors don't care if the stuff they published is right. Uh, yeah, I'll just I'll make a comment on that. I mean, if you're familiar with uh, the Proximal Origins paper that was published about the origins of COVID very early on, um, I, I would go even further. Maybe this is a little bit more cynical. That, that it, it would, the, the editors didn't care that it was right, but the editors cared that it had the right message. Um, and Proximal Origin says we can completely rule out any laboratory-based. Um, I, I have a paper out for review on NOAA's billion-dollar disaster data set, um, which is a mess. Um, and I got, for the first time in my career, I got a message back from the journal. It's a nature journal um, that said, um, I didn't, hadn't heard anything after submitting for about, about four weeks. They said, we're sorry for the delay. We had to send this out for an additional political review. Uh, you were criticizing a U.S. federal agency, and we wanted to explore the sensitivities that it's going forward, it's under review, but I've never had that before. And I, I think, that, I mean, there is this overlay, and again, I think, you know, journals like universities want to be players. They want to be political players, and that means being on message. Nature magazine endorsed Joe Biden. 
Nature Publishes Science. Um, and there's, there was a research study that was done afterwards that, that surveyed uh, public opinion on nature, whether they knew nature or not. But the fact that, that nature endorsed Biden led to more people not trusting the journal. Um, Matt said, you know, the universities have lost trust in the United States. That's, you know, for years I gave talks saying science is robust, everybody loves science. Um, and I think we're doing this to ourselves um, in some degree, and, and it, it's all a desire to be a player in, in politics, in my view. Uh, I have a quick comment on this, Ken. Um, I mean, my experience as, as an author and as a referee who observes other referee comments is uh, there seems to be increasing attention uh, from referees to reframe your paper to like there's a lot of attention on framing especially if you send a paper to a science journal this is in my experience and those who I've talked with about this um, so someone thinks framing is important uh, certainly referees and so if you ask the question like who has who has incentives to enforce objective framing I don't know the answer to that but I but I have observed that uh, you know referees have incentives to enforce subjective framing um, and impose impose it upon an author. Down here, Bjorn Lomborg. Microphone, please. Just very briefly, because I want to point out, you know, I, I follow you on Substack, and I just think it's amazing. What's, what's, the, what's the Substack called, Bjorn? <laughs> the, the Honest Broker. <laughs> the Honest uh, Broker, thank you. Yeah, okay. Oh, right, sorry, <laughs> yes. The Honest Broker? Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, um, and I think it's an amazing fact that you can actually sort of make your living off of the Substack, uh, and that's an amazing thing, and a lot more people should think about that. But I wanted to ask you, do you think this is a sort of viable secondary? Obviously, it's not our preferred model, but you know, get a lot of researchers doing all these answer, uh, or make all these very annoying, uh, uh, uncomfortable truths on their substacks and actually get this out to a lot of people. Do you think this is a viable sort of secondary model for, for universities as they're losing confidence that we could actually have a lot of researchers that we go on substack and follow instead? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, let me just first in answering that say, um, Bjorn's gone down this path <laughs> before me with skeptical environmentalists, um, which I used my first graduate seminar, had faculty across campus telling me how can, you know, he can't teach that, that heretical stuff on campus. Um, and Bjorn was the subject of a campaign uh, from IPCC authors against Cambridge University Press, which publishes the IPCC, saying we're not going to publish with you anymore unless you get rid of Bjorn's books. Um, none of that ever happened. But, but it, this has been percolating for a long time. Um, it's, it's, I, I don't have any general lessons because people talk to me like, you know, how do you, how do, you do what you do? And I would say, well, the first thing you do is you go through 15 years of shit and then, you know, and then you're, you're, you're good. Um, I think that it, I'm extraordinarily lucky and privileged to be able to do what I do and be independent. I don't think it's a generalizable model. I do think there will be people, you know, I'm a B-list public intellectual, you're an A-list public intellectual, and I think that's about where it ends um, for people to be able to go independent. Um, I, I, you know, I have very strong positive feelings about my academic career. Um, I couldn't have done everything I've done without, you know, academic freedom and tenure and all that. Um, I talk to younger people, and it's, you know, I need to spend whatever, five, seven years getting tenure, and I, I can't upset higher ups. Um, and by the time they get tenure, they're like, well, I, I, I'm not gonna start, you know, changing and, and upsetting people now. So, so until we, we build norms and a culture that in, when it comes to politically contentious topics that academics study, there's gonna be a diversity of legitimate views. It's okay to express them. Achieving disagreement is a valuable thing. Um, I think universities are going to be hard pressed to do this. I will say, you know, think tanks, um, right now, um, in the United States at least, think tanks are a place where I have found, I, I've had more institutional support from AEI, more commitment to academic freedom in the last three months I've been affiliated than, you know, the last 10 years of my university. So I am optimistic that there will be these new models, um, but I, 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 don't ha I don't think it's the answer. I, I don't know what it is. Okay, we have it down here in the front. Uh, there's uh, something called noble cause corruption. Could you comment on that? And is that a factor in some of these uh, studies that are done? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. I mean, Ainsley Kello, um, 
in Tasmania. Has, has, he wrote a book on noble cause corruption in environmental science in particular. Um, th there has been a trend I've noticed um, among colleagues and students over the years in the climate space um, with a focus less on, oh, I want to understand the climate. It's really interesting, too. We have to get people to act in a certain way on climate. Um, if, I mean, I'll take, I work a lot on extreme events, and if, if you look at what the IPCC says, chapter 12, table 12.12, .12, deep in the bowels of the IPCC, it's really good science and it's really accurate. Um, I, I, I can't, number one, env environmental journalists and climate journalists won't talk to me, but, but why there's this disconnect between, I, I sort of understand it, um, how we talk about climate and, and what the science actually says, it's, of course, it's noble cause corruption. It's the idea that, that there's a bigger calling here that's too important to, to, to let you know, inconvenient science out, out of the gates. So at the Breakthrough Institute, there's a guy named Patrick Brown who um, he's written a couple pieces on how he had a paper published in Nature on wildfire, climate change and wild paper. And he said, well, let me, let me pull back the curtain and tell you the choices I made uh, you know, no research misconduct, nothing like that, but, but what I chose to emphasize to maximize the chances that I would get published in a press release. And so, um, you know, the, the choices that are made, it's, it's, if you're looking at wildfire, say, it's, it's not what are the many factors that contribute to wildfire incidents, and let's explore them all. The framing is what role did climate change have in the wildfire? And so that gets to the, the issues. The is at universities, I think there's less issues in law schools in um, business schools and engineering schools because these are professional schools and they have standards and they have to do things. I think a lot of the, the sciences, particularly sciences that are directly relevant to policy, so it's your list, health, environment, um, and so on, are more subject to these issues where narratives take root and become very difficult to, to pr press back against. Okay, back here. Yeah, I, I want to comment that there's been a strong push in the physical sciences to tell a story uh, to explain why you're doing this work. And I think objective statements don't make as good a story. They don't have that human element that helps, and this is often advice. I was at an NSF uh, event where we were nominally reviewing proposals, but you know, sort of the lunchtime event was how to tell a better story and why you should be a better science communicator. So I think there is a, a serious pressure to use more uh, narrative, interesting flow. And frankly, there's a place for that. I mean, you know, a science paper that doesn't kind of follow a trajectory is very hard to read. Um, but I do think that tends to favor subjective statements, and I have a suggestion of how to you know, make sure that doesn't go too, but continue to go too far, which is I think you have the right metric now to put up against citation indexes. Every paper, every journal should be required to run your algorithm right on the whole text because uh, falsifiable statements are the basis of science, and so they should be you know, and this is my frustration uh, in any setting, like even many things happening today, there are a lot of claims made that are not easily falsifiable. So um, I, I, I like what you said, but I like your, your algorithm or your method. So, so. Thank you. I mean, I like certainly in mo really probably most forms of communication, subjectivity is most appropriate. The question is, how appropriate is it in articles that are scientific in nature? And if so, where in the article? So I think analysis of the full paper would, would be fruitful. I believe the biggest challenge is how do we break out of this equilibrium we're in where uh, there, is, there are tremendous rewards to following the norms, having your research confirm the norms, and there is tremendous pain we're going against them. And since people respond to the incentives that they're offered, it's no surprise that we are where we, where we are. And I'll also add that, you know, outside of the, there's the university and research, which is its own self-reinforcing system. The more people who have written from a given perspective, uh, the, the stronger the resistance is against anything that's going to come in and, and, and come from the outside and try to debunk that. 
Uh, the media is, has its own set of incentives that are related to catastroph catastrophes, in particular in the, in, the, uh, in the environmental space and in, 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 in promoting a narrative. And, and in, in environment and climate, the financial industry also has uh, a vested interest. I've, as I've written about uh, before in a Wall Street Journal op-ed, uh, the financial industry benefits from the idea that we have to wipe out all of the capital, all of the machines that we have right now because there's something wrong with them, they're dirty, and replace them with clean machines. Um, and from a societal perspective, it goes back to Bastiat's broken window fallacy. You don't create societal prosperity by breaking windows and then hiring a glassmaker or window repairer to repair the windows. But the glassmaker sure does benefit from that, as do financial institutions who might uh, have to finance the, uh, uh, the owners of the buildings that have to get their, their windows replaced. So um, uh, I, I don't have a good answer for how exactly we, we, we get, out, get out of this. One would hope that universities would be a place where uh, you could have some type of heterodox thinking, but apparently the incentives that we face here are, uh, are pretty, pretty problematic. Yeah, I just want to pick up on the point about, uh, I mean, I've been around long enough to see this, the rise of this subfield called science communication. And I think on balance, I mean, we want everybody to be better communicators, but the, the, the subfield of science communication, I think, has done a lot of damage um, to the interrelationship of science, policy, and politics. Because the idea, and, and what we tell students, is go out and change the world. Go preach your, your message from your, your paper, your research. Um, number one, scientific papers don't change the world. Number two, um, the, the analogy I use is if, if we have music instruments instead of scientific paper, everybody going out there and playing their musical instrument, we just have noise. The, you know, the way that we connect expertise with decision makers and democracy is more like a symphony orchestra than it is everybody going out and communicating. Um, and we've also created the impression to, to young scientists that you should go out and be political advocates. Um, and you should go out and advocate your, your cause. And that, there's two sides of that. One is advocating your cause and then advocating against those people who say the wrong things. Um, and I see that a lot from, from young scientists today. I would love for them to have rigorous training in policy and politics, um, but, but communication is, is only a real small part of that. Well, it's a, it's a topic for another day, but you know, universities in general have moved uh, just generally away from science and, toward, and towards activism. I mean, if you, if, you, if, you, if you sort of listen to the speeches that university leaders give, you often hear less about uh, scientific excellence and more about being a fertile ground for activism, which is kind of, activism is sort of the opposite of scientific inquiry in some ways. It means you're already convinced of what it is that you think you believe and you're just gonna act to make it happen. Okay, I've been told by Terry that we need to cut it off, so thanks very much. Great panel and uh... okay.